want to do is have a conversation about how to do politics differently. Um, when I wrote <coughs> The Open Tribe, which is a book that's down and available uh, at the company's book, um, bookstore today, if you want to buy a copy. It was about trying to create a politics that wasn't about having the answer, that wasn't about telling people what to think, but about asking the right questions, a politics of inquiry and of conversation. So Ruth and I thought we'd try and have a conversation because we've both been in campus since its founding, I guess because we share a belief that there needs to be some sort of bridge between conventional Westminster politics, uh, Ruth's in the House of Lords, um, I used to be in Westminster politics, and an alternative approach to politics, but also because of the triggering thought we had when we were talking about this, that it isn't as if there's a big tribe of us that vote in elections and believe in conventional Westminster politics and are members of traditional political parties and, you know, reactionary, <laughs> and another tribe of us that are countercultural and creative and innovative and wanting to explore alternatives. But these two tribes exist inside most of us. Most of us, when elections are coming up, are thinking, oh shit, I better vote. And, you know, if I don't vote for one of the conventional parties, then the Tories will get in. And so I might be reasonable and realistic. And then on the other hand, we're wanting desperately for something creative and innovative and more exciting and more real and more human to happen to us. So we thought that was the conversation we want to have. Is there a bridge? Can there be a bridge? How would we build it? What would we do with it? And, and we'll ask you to join in that with us. But I thought I'd start, Ruth, by just asking you, you know, how did you get to here? What's been your political journey that means you're sitting in this room and you've spent your Sunday here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've spent my Sunday here. Um, it's really weird because we can't really see you. And, and in a sense, it's a bit <laughs> having a conversation with people we can't see. Um, I mean, I, I got here, and I suppose really my early politics was with the women's movement. And although I've been a Labour Party member for an awfully long time, it's not where my political identity lies, even though I'm now a Labour peer. Um, and I came into Compass with dissatisfaction with new Labour. But Compass has changed so much, I think, since it started. And very much, I mean, it's always had this slogan about we want to be the change we want to see in the world. But I think it's really only in the last year or so that we started really trying to take that seriously in the politics that we do. So, like having a conference like this, having a conference like we had last autumn, rather than the traditional, you know, big names on platforms speaking down. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited by the kind of way Compass is trying to think, yes, how we do those politics differently. And um, I don't certainly have any answers to it. And like you, Sue, I think I carry both sides sort of in me. Um, but I kind of, when, you know, I spend my time, most of, a lot of my time in the House of Lords, as a politician, I do, don't think of myself as a politician, but I say that I do my politics with compass, and that's how it feels to me. Um, and it's difficult, I, I'm not, I can't say that I'm taking into the Lords the way I do my politics in compass, because it's very difficult to do that. But... Um, oh, you ought to try that. <laughs> <laughs> it would be fun. I'm just, because I was just thinking my first politics was... Well, I'm trying to get the order right. Probably sort of hippie counterculture, you know, um, street theatre and stuff to start with. And then probably nearly the Communist Party, I only didn't quite join. And then feminism. And then community politics. And then the Labour Party. And then a period being non-aligned and confused. And I guess Compass felt like the only place that you could live with that sort of history. I mean, I'd be interested in other people here. It's hard to see, but... What proportion of people would see themselves as being part of conventional politics in the room? Yeah. You sort of I, I recognise it too. I'll put hands up for both. So I recognise yeah. so, so you're part of it. Well, I am. Split? But I'm there in a very sort of um, creatively ambivalent position. I'm in it because I don't think it works. What about other people? Well, how, 
uh, I'm a lifelong member of the Labour Party, but I would still consider myself unconventional in uh, what I do within it. And how, in what way? Well, um, I, for example, uh, would um, accept a lot of uh, Green Party ideas uh, and would be happy to have a, a, a Labour government with a small over majority, overall majority, but a fair sprinkling of other people, other radicals, Greens and uh, others, to keep them up to the mark. Thanks. Okay. Well, woman here was going to say something. Well, in that, um, m myself and uh, some uh, some friends, we've started a party because we we realise that it, we have a party political system, and actually, unless you have a group of independents in the general election, we have the system we have, and although it needs reforming, we've decided to do something within it rather than wait for change. So, what part is that? Well, it's called Populous. It is just starting. It's Populous party you can find it on facebook and and on twitter and it is uh you know lots of people have said there needs to be a ukip of the left i'm not sure that's that's <laughs> what we are going for but ukip are teaching us some stuff about about how to get coverage etc but we're not standing until 2020 <laughs> so <And laughs> anyone who sort of says let's abandon the conventional politics political system altogether and build something else you know, they, they, we're tarnishing ourselves getting involved. No? So we're all... Okay, do you want to say some more? No, just disillusion with the uh, political party. I'm from Italy, so, you know... You yeah. have no hope it's even harder there than it is here. But Britain, I think it's going down, uh, down, 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 down spiral. I think it's not going well, either. <coughs> With the, the the leaders now, they're not they're not leading their country as they, they could. So I don't labor also. I think at the end of the day, when they go into power, they play the same game, more or less. You see with the housing situation, yeah. they didn't change anything basically, not much really. So okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Say some more, Ruth, about why Compass. What it is that Compass is trying to do that you think is different and. <coughs> and creating that sort of bridge? Um, well, in a sense, today is an example of it. It's trying to bring... I mean, the, the, big, the big change that Compass made from when it started was when it opened out beyond the Labour Party. And that was a, that was a big, kind of, quite a scary thing for us to do. Because we came out of Labour um, as a kind of ginger group within Labour, and quite a few people left when we did that because they saw us as moving away from what we, we set up, what we set ourselves up to do, and we opened ourselves out to anyone who shares our political values, to, irrespective of, of where they, they may be placed. And but I think that's sort of set in train a whole it, things that we probably didn't foresee at the time in terms of much more emphasis on on the how on the, as opposed to the what, um, and the, the importance about how we engage with each other at a personal level, um, and then how we take that, those personal relationships, into the political world. And for me, that's, that's something that I've always, it's always been important to me to try and make those links, and, and finally, I've got a, for, a kind of an organisation or a forum which is which is trying to do that seriously. I mean, it is quite different. I mean, because we're both on the management committee, so just, but we have got now Greens and Plaid Cymru and Lib Dems and Labour Party and non-aligned people all trying to share the thinking about how we work together. So it's not just that it's not just that Compass has got those people involved, but I guess we're all beginning to believe that there's some sort of social movement alliance, I mean, what happens in Parliament, God only knows, and what happens post-election, God only knows, but that creating an alliance of that wider social movement is part of how we're going to get social change. And I guess that's what... And the other thing, Ufa was talking about this this morning, I thought his contribution was really good, about the alternative in Denmark, that generosity has been really missing from the political world. For anybody who's been in conventional political parties, you know, it's, it's a snake pit. And... We've tried really hard to be kind to each other and enjoy each other's company and have parties and do things that are not 
And if people disagree, we try to be curious. Now that, you know, actually we're just, I think, right at the very beginning of that. Because we're being curious at the moment about people who we like. The difficult bit's going to be being curious. I mean, you know, being curious maybe about UKIP or being curious about what's happening in other countries or just that sense of if there's a disagreement, let's explore it rather than, you know, put up barricades and start shouting. I guess the question we don't know the answer to is how we're going to link, create a bridge between conventional political parties and the Westminster system and all the things that we see that's wrong with that, but that's the only way that power is going to control stuff that happens on a big scale, and the alternatives that are being built that we're hearing about today, and I don't, you know, in the last four minutes, I'd just be interested in people's ideas about how we might make that bridge work, what would be the best way of connecting up the conventional political parties with with the rest of us and how, how what role we should play. Well then there. Um, You're gonna have to shout, but for sure. Um, I should declare an interest because I'm on the cooperative party. Yeah, um, but I think as we what we know about how social change happened, particularly the kind of scale of change that we know we have to be making, is that you need inside or outside of coalitions. When you need people being incredibly strategic and tactical tactical about how you make the changes inside, but you need to keep passing the baton. And as ever on the left, sometimes we snipe at each other too much. And we don't pass the bat on, but we alienate, alienate and we don't build that inside or outside a chain. And it is true that people vote in the middle, but therefore the really exciting question is where we define the boundaries. And I think on the left we sometimes we're so scared of, of defi allowing the boundaries to creep further out on our side that the middle, of course, has drifted over. So I think our challenge is twofold, is to get the boundaries bigger again, so the centre shifts, um, and to keep those inside the coalitions working and not attacking each other, but keeping open and listening and cooperating. Yeah, Natalie Bennett talks a lot about how lonely it is, you know, for the single green councillor being sniped at constantly by everybody else, and actually how we could be more generous when we do share an awful lot of of our ideas. Somebody else. Come on, how are we going to do this? We've got to change the world. Thank you, people being single councillors, uh, either as uh, Tory or Labour in, in various places uh, uh, over the past century. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that there's very little um, about uh, politics and how it works and who's responsible for what in the education system. I take names and addresses on my website, um, and uh, out of the people in London, less than half of them know what borough they're in. That's just ridiculous. They just haven't got a clue what borough they're in. How many people have got kids who are really interested in politics? Good. <laughs> How did you get that right? Well done. Ruth, final question. I mean, you know, what's... Yeah, you're in a house of lords, so you're in an important place in the sense of getting that bridge to work. What do you think the bridge ought to be like? Oh, God. Um, I, I, well, if, if I had a clear answer to that, so <coughs> we'd perhaps not be um, asking the questions here. But I, I mean, I, I was struck, one of the things that struck me in your Open Tribes book was, well, I think it is partly about generosity and it's partly about, it came up very strongly, it's about listening. And I don't think we do enough listening to each other in politics. We're too, too busy getting ready to say our next thing and to try and convince the person you know, we're speaking to of our rightness. And perhaps if we were a bit more open and we listened to each other more, then that would help to start to create the bridge. But I'll put the question back to you. <laughs> well, I've, I've been recently, well, it was in the book, but I read Richard Sennett's book about conversation. And he talked about the difference between dialectic and dialogic conversations. I mean, the words don't matter, do they? But dialectic is, is, is what I guess we hope for, which is sort of synthesis. You know, that we have an argument, we agree, people from different perspectives build something that's shared. But he was saying, actually, that's not the most interesting thing. The most interesting thing is a conversation where we don't necessarily reach the same point. But we learn something about each other as the, and change as a result of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.